Good day, beloved. We are online this morning only, but we are all together worshiping our God, and we are grateful that you have become a part of us. We will be spending this morning talking again about the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us to pray and dealing with the power and the glory forever and ever. Let us worship our God. pray. O God, source and advocate of peace, we face this day with the challenge of new war in the news. One of the strongest countries has attacked one of the weakest. Our hearts may be anxious and angry over this event. We wonder about the fate of Ukraine because it doesn't look good. Their conflict is not a new one and great suffering has been experienced in Ukraine's past. May we advocate peace with you, O God, and with Christ our leader, for he has called us to be peacemakers. May we live in hope, O Lord, as we look forward to the victory of peace on earth, our home. To great blessings Jesus has called us in his model prayer, which we now echo as we sing. Creator God, we bless your name. Much of today's sermon is taken from a book called The Lord's Prayer in Times Such as These by Frank Thomas. So this is the last week that we're spending on the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So in that spirit, hearest these words from the Gospel of St. Matthew. 
After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That, my friends, is the King James Version. Now, the interesting part of this is that the ending does not appear in most Bibles today. In Matthew 6.13 that we looked at last week, we see, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that's it. But if you look at the footnote, it reads, some later manuscripts read, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a footnote because the earliest manuscripts, when the King James Version that I read earlier was translated, those weren't yet discovered. And since 1611, many earlier manuscripts, manuscripts have been found, and they end with lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But how can I preach a series on the Lord's Prayer without talking about this last phrase? Biblical scholars call this ending the doxology, coming from the word doxo, meaning glory. Simply put, it's a short word of praise. Most of the manuscripts, the writings from the early church fathers and the commentaries on the Bible do not include this ending. So how and why did it become so attached to the Lord's Prayer? Very early on in the life of the church, when people prayed the Lord's Prayer, this doxology was added. A doxology at the end of a prayer was a common practice in the Jewish tradition and also in the practice of the early church. I personally think it happened when the Lord's Prayer eventually began to be used as a regular part of worship. Without the doxology, it, it, it ends abruptly. So when it was used as a teaching, it might not need this ending. But if you were using it in worship, they felt it needed to have something else there. These words may or may not have been on the lips of Jesus, perhaps not in the context of the Lord's Prayer, but it certainly was on the lips of King David. This is a doxology David prayed a thousand years before Jesus. See if you can hear our doxology and these words from 1 Chronicles 29. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Don't you hear the doxology in that? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We know now that this doxology, this added praise to the end of the Lord's Prayer, was added to the biblical text sometime in the second or third century. The church somehow added, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not just to the worship service, but somehow it got transcribed into the biblical text. It was added to the Gospel of Matthew and was carried until modern biblical scholars concurred that it was a late addition to the text and some translations started leaving it out. So why did the early church feel the need to add this doxology to the actual biblical text? I believe they put it there because they knew that we could not be left ending with the reality of evil and the severity of temptation. The church, in its understanding of prayer and the sensitivity to life, realized that deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation are too perilous a note to end a prayer. Though that is where Jesus ended it. Again, Jesus understood the true reality and nature of evil. 
Jesus understood that evil was so vicious and destructive that he prayed that we would not that we would be delivered from it. And it is something unsettling to be left with the reality of evil as the last word. The last word out of Jesus' mouth was that evil is so terrible that I'm going to pray that you be delivered from it and that you not be led into temptation. The church could grasp the true and present danger in the reality of evil. The church made the decision to end the prayer then on a positive affirmation. The church even said, if we have to go through evil, then thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We might have to go through evil, but we can be delivered from it because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What does this doxology mean? Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It's an affirmation of faith that we will prevail in the end despite the most brutal and honest facts and assessments of our current reality. No matter how evil evil is, God alone is the kingdom, power, and glory. That last statement is not mine, so let me tell you this story. Admiral Jim Stockdale was the highest ranking U.S. military officer in the Hanoi prison camp during the Vietnam War. He was imprisoned for eight years, tortured many times, and lived without any prisoner rights, no set release date, and no certainty as to whether he would ever see his family. He fought an internal war against his captors and their attempts to use the prisoners for propaganda. At one point, he beat himself with a stool and cut himself with a razor deliberately, disfiguring himself so that he could not be put on a video as an example of well-trained prisoners. Knowing that discovery would mean torture and perhaps death, he exchanged secret intelligence information with his wife through their letters. After his release, he was given the highest military and civilian awards and accommodation and commendation. When interviewed, he said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but I would also prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life. And in that re retrospect, I would not trade. The interviewer asked him, who did not make it out? He said, the optimists. They were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go. Then they say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then Christmas again. And they would die of a broken heart. And summing it all up, he said, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose with the need for discipline to confront the most brutal facts in your current reality, whatever they might be. This is the affirmation of thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It is the faith that we will prevail in the end. God and God alone is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. No matter what happens, God is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And because God is the kingdom and the power and the glory, because you belong to God, you can prevail in the end. This is important because you can never afford to lose belief that you will prevail in the end. If you give that up, if you, if you lose that, then you will have been swallowed up in temptation and trial. You will have fallen into the hands of evil. So when you find yourself going through something terrible, as some in our congregation are, do not get caught up in it when it will end. Do not assume that you are going through, what you are going through will be over by Christmas. Then when Christmas passes, you say, well, then it'll be over by Easter. And then when Easter passes, you'll say, well, it'll be over by Thanksgiving. And you get back to Christmas again and you die of a broken heart. I mean, that's what we've been doing with this pandemic, isn't it? We keep saying, well, it'll be over by such and such, or it'll be over by such and such. I don't know what each and every person is going through, and I don't know how long they've been going through it. I don't know how long the storm will last. I don't know how 
dark the night will get. You're in something that could be def the defining moment of your life, and it's going to take time. Get yourself set for that long duration. Hunker down and trench because the way is hard, the road is rough, and the hills are hard to climb. But do not give up the belief that you will prevail in the end. Do not give up. Do not quit. For now we know someone who is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Notice what Stockdale says. He says, you must combine faith in the fact that you will prevail with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality. You're lonely, you're tired, you have cancer, your health is failing, your children will not obey you, you have made some mistakes and bad choices, you're living in the land of mistakes and regret, thinking of what you would do if you had the chance to do it over again. What are the most brutal facts of our current reality? It makes no difference what the brutal facts say. This will be the defining moment in our lives. Not only shall you prevail, but this will be the defining event in your life. And in that retrospect, we can't trade it. We will have the victory. This is the thing that we're going to go through, and it's going to bless us. This pain that we are shouldering will be the defining moment of our lives. Back in 1997, Frank Thomas, who wrote that book I told you about earlier, tells of a time when he went to Cape Town, South Africa. It was during the second of three championship runs of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. The Bulls were up three to two on someone in a best of seven series, and they were trying to close their opponents out. Now, in South Africa, they did not show the game live, but on tape delay at three o'clock in the morning. By the time that he watched it, the game was already over. He could have turned over to CNN and found out who won the game before watching it, but that would have killed the suspense. So he watched the game not knowing the score. The Bulls were losing in the first quarter, but he didn't worry because they'd been down in the first quarter before. And then they were losing in the second quarter, but not to worry, it's still early. And then they were losing in the third quarter, and he said that he, had, he became a little concerned. But along about the fourth quarter, things got really tough. The Bulls were down 13 points with five minutes to go. All of a sudden, he started to bite his nails, and it got real tense. His anxiety got so high that it dawned on him that he could just turn the channel and see who won the game. He said that he got so nervous and upset about the outcome that he turned over to CNN and found out who won the game. CNN was functioning in real time while the game was on tape delay. The battle had already been fought and the victory had already been won. He said that he found out that the Bulls had won. And then he went back over and to watch the rest of the game. And it was easier to watch because he knew the end of the story. It was easier to watch the score because even though they were trailing in the tape delay time zone, they had already won the game in real time. That is why the church added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It switched you over to another time. The church took you from tape delay to real time, from earthly perspective to a heavenly view. And while you are nervous and upset with evil, while you are distressed and distraught, the church has changed the channel. The, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God is greater and stronger and more powerful than evil. All things are in God's hands. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need to be praying for those who are in the Ukraine right now and those around the world who are suffering abuse and torment. But we know that God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The victory is won. 
God will take care and redeem evil. God is the kingdom. God is the power and God is the glory. Never lose faith in the end of the story. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, listen to your children. As we come to our time of communion, I'm reminded that this morning, because we are online, we are around many tables. And yet it is one table of our Lord that we are invited to, that we are invited to come and pray for peace. As events are unfolding in the Ukraine and around the world, we pray for peace. So as we take the bread, Christ's body broken for us, and drink the cup this morning, his blood poured out for our sins. Let us remember that we are not alone in this world, that we are one in the Lord. Let us celebrate communion together as we partake of the elements.
This morning we've been talking about for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And so an appropriate song to sing would be How Great Thou Art. So as we begin to sing How Great Thou Art, let us remember that the evil in the world is not the end all be all. For God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Problems in the Ukraine, not problems, war in the Ukraine being brought on by people who do not understand God's call for peace in the world is not the end all be all. For God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So let us sing today with enthusiasm from our couches and from our chairs, How Great Thou Art. glorious day we've had worshiping our God. Now we turn towards Lent. 
The Season of Lent begins Wednesday night, and I hope that you can join us Wednesday evening at 5.30 for sandwiches and at 6.30 for Ash Wednesday. I hope that you can come and receive the ashes as we talk about this journey that we are beginning towards Jesus going to the cross and his resurrection. Wednesday evenings, we, throughout Lent, we will be having dinner at 5.30 and at 6.30, we will be having a discussion about the different sermons that you will be hearing. You'll be hearing sermons from me, you'll be hearing sermons from Gene Spillman and Anna Holloway and Tom about the parables of Jesus. So I hope that you can join us beginning this Wednesday evening at 5.30 for dinner and 6.30 for our Ash Wednesday worship service. And now as we listen to some music to end this service, I want to invite you to give. You can go to GiveLify on our church's website and give that way. You can give by sending a check to the P.O. Box at the church, or you can just drop it by the church sometime. The ministries of this church are important, and I hope that each and every one of you will continue to support it. May God bless you, and I hope to see everyone Wednesday evening. Amen. Mm-hmm.